am extremely excited to see all of you here. Um, we'll thankfully have the opportunity to share with you. Um, I can tell you that uh, I feel very privileged to have somewhat of a unique uh, um, experience with Citizen Corps and the community emergency response teams in our state. Um, I was a part of the group who helped put together our very first state Citizen Corps Council and attended that first council meeting. Um, went through a variety of experiences um, as a council member. I then took a brief uh, tour of duty um, at Volunteer West Virginia as the state coordinator of Citizen Corps. Um, and then now am over in the Department of Homeland Security um, Emergency Management in, in DMAPS and actually am the one who uh, writes the grant applications that now funds uh, our Citizen Corps and CERT programs across the state. So have had a number of different relationships and am uh, really glad to see you. It is always good to um, see the faces of the people who actually do the work out across our state. Um, I'm here with Stephanie Yu. Stephanie will tell you a bit about herself in a moment. The first thing we wanted to do actually, um, it's not about us, it's really about you. So we really want to go across across the room and uh, do some very quick introductions. Um, Stephanie, you want to make a couple remarks? Sure. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. Thanks for being here. This is our first ever CERT conference in West Virginia, and we're going we're gonna to hope that it's a roaring success and we can do it again. Um, I do want to say David gave some credit to the folks that put this conference together. And there are some people who have helped out here and there, but this has really been a one-woman show, and that is Gina's show. So I think you all have worked with her and know that she has done the lion's share of the work to put this all together. So we appreciate that and I'm looking forward to it. Um, I also just kind of want to say there's a lot of familiar faces in this room. There's also a lot of new faces, which I'm excited about um, because I think that's a good thing because this is spreading and we're doing something right. Um, the other thing I was going to say is uh, as the executive director of Volunteer West Virginia, we work with a lot of volunteers and in a lot of cases, we're doing a service project here or there. Doesn't matter if they show up or not. It's not a commitment. It's not the kind of commitment that you all make. So we just want to acknowledge that, how important that is. When we need you, you're there, and it's critical that you are. So we appreciate that. Um, without further ado, let's kick it off. You wanna? Um, at this time, I am happy to introduce my boss. Um, Joe introduced himself. He is the Cabinet Secretary for the Department of Military Affairs and Public Safety. Um, oversees a number of our emergency response functions across the state. Um, he is a, a very competent and capable person in, in the duties that the governor has entrusted him with. Uh, but more than that, I think um, for any of us who know Joe, know he is a personal person. Um, he is extremely approachable, extremely accessible, um, genuinely cares about uh, the people across the state and I can say it, having the good fortune to work with him every day um, cares about the people who he works directly with um, and I think we're very fortunate to have him. Um, there's a, bi a biography that's included uh, lots of good things that Joe has accomplished uh, but without further ado Joe if you want to come up and uh, share a couple remarks and we'll go from there we'll get this started. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? David, I appreciate those kind remarks. There is no money in the budget for a pay raise. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 you know, I have it in my remarks, but I'll just go ahead and say it now. I certainly appreciate uh, the opportunity to stand here before you. Uh, you know, I can't say enough great things about what David does on a daily basis to help keep West Virginia safe. Um, he is one of the most competent individuals I've met and one of the hardest working individuals I've met. So uh, those of you that, that don't know him, um, when you start working with him, you'll realize um, how genuinely he cares and, and how much uh, or how important it is for him to uh, see West Virginia move forward in all the areas that we're responsible for. Uh, I, I appreciate the invitation. I really do to be here today. I, I did not realize this was the first state CERT conference. So um, I, I, you know, it's much more of an honor now. Um, you know, I, I want to share a few thoughts and perspectives today. Um, you know, I, I certainly appreciate Gina's efforts. Uh, she does a, a great job as our State Citizen Corps Coordinator. Um, you know, the other staff at Volunteer West Virginia, Stephanie, you, you can't say enough great things about what she's done. I know she helped Gina with the logistics of this conference. Um, 
I certainly know that there was a planning team that helped put this together and you know I, I can't say enough great things about uh, the work that you do to volunteer to, to do things um, to, to push West Virginia forward as well uh, I appreciate each of you I think most importantly your attendance here states a lot you know it seems like every time we have a conference that's similar to this we have a bad storm the night before or the day of just, I mean it just never fails um, so you know that you're here says a lot I, I laid awake a couple hours last night listening to storm roll through Putnam County uh, just hoping that one of the trees wasn't going to crash through my house so um, you know it was uh, I, it's been a while since I've had wind like that in Putnam County I think they said it was about 55 60 miles an hour out in, in our neck of the woods and about 70 miles an hour in Cabell County so uh, and I live smack dab in the middle of a, uh, of a small forest so it's, it's always a bit disconcerting when these things happen um, it, preparedness you know I want to start talking about preparedness uh, you know events come in all types all shapes all sizes um, but they continue to show how building individual and community preparedness is more important than ever uh, real threats exist I think we all know those the natural threats the man-made threats the terroristic threats um, you know some of you are, are familiar with the most recent research that that FEMA has concluded on personal preparedness it is a very interesting read it's from September 2013 it's on FEMA's website I, if you have not looked at it I would highly suggest you look at it because uh, there is some insightful uh, information in there and that's certainly some of the things that I that I want to hit on today um, you know I, I think it's it's safe to say that even though most people acknowledge that they're vulnerable to some threats uh, we still have a great challenge convincing them that, that tangible actions they take can and will reduce risk and it doesn't just reduce their personal risk it helps expand the capacity of our response and recovery systems and that's key and I think we all understand that but too few people are taking action even though they know it's something they should do we have to help people grow in their proficiency to talk about preparedness you know it's, it's easy to stand around and talk about what we do on a daily basis but are we really making the effort to talk about the preparedness efforts that we're putting forth to help the citizens of West Virginia but you've got to be comfortable in doing that at the same time you know the, the report highlights that less than one-third people um, less than one-third of people report talking about preparedness with anyone and and that's troubling if you ask me uh, and that's true even though we feel like we're saturating the public with preparedness information I think on a daily basis in our world we're talking about preparedness we're trying to live preparedness but we're not talking enough with others about preparedness even after all disasters that have occurred only 29 percent of households report having disaster supplies in their homes that they regularly keep updated that's even more troubling uh, you know and I certainly think it's unacceptable you know I, I will admit there was a period of time when I first started in, in this job as deputy secretary some years ago that I didn't take that aspect seriously and, and I've since learned the value of, of being prepared um, people are neither either not aware of what they should have or unwilling to take the simple of actions to create these kits and to, to, to update themselves and understand what their what the shortcomings are what their gaps are uh, lastly and perhaps most importantly uh, we're still only getting about one-fourth of people to attend training and or volunteer uh, and that's something that I think we need to really to drive the train on um, all of this means that there's a lot we still need to do and I think we all understand that we have to continue our efforts we have to modify and extend extend them as possible uh, just to begin to sustain the progress that we've already made that's not an effort to really increase our capacity um, I, I really think that we you know we have to work on a daily basis to try to enhance our capabilities um, more so than just keep it at, the, at, at an even pace uh, we're, we're very good at understanding where we are today but it's becoming increasingly more difficult to stay where we are today and a lot of that is due to resources and I understand that but that's why collaboration and cooperation are so key uh, many of you heard me say some of these things before but certainly you've, you've probably heard me say this before that uh, there are many things that go into emergency preparedness and recovery but there are two things that are I consider that are most critical and they're probably most important to me and that's attitude and relationships um, you know most of you I think are positive you're proactive you're resourceful you're creative I respect and appreciate that very much but it, it's it, the most important thing that we have to offer folks is encouragement you know a listening ear uh, just physical presence sometimes goes a long way work is stressful I think we all understand that it takes real effort to stay emotionally balanced especially in trying situations 
uh, and to keep believing that our efforts are producing positive outcomes. Um, you know, those of us that, that have worked 20, 20 hours a day for a month straight, and I always reference Hurricane Katrina when I'm in a setting like this because the operation that West Virginia conducted for Hurricane Katrina in 2005, um, in my eyes, was something to behold. It didn't go perfectly, um, but it showed co collaboration, it showed cooperation, and it showed people understanding what the person next to them was going through as well. And, and keeping that emotional balance was very, very challenging for those 30 days, but it was very, very important and critical to what we do to achieve success. Uh, I appreciate the support that everybody lends to law enforcement, fire service, and other responders. Uh, positive attitude is essential to constructive relationships. I think that's a no-brainer. Uh, you know, I, we all have shrinking financial resources, and, and we understand that. Uh, it, it's easy to kind of go into defensive mode and start protecting our turf, but this is the most important time to break out of that habit. Um, you know, our collective presence at this meeting is an indication that we know there's better ways to do things. Uh, sometimes it involves uncomfortable change. Uh, sometimes it involves an evolution of our processes. But those are necessary in our capabilities to be more self-sufficient. Expanding the pool of trained and available personnel through programs such as this one uh, helps us address the challenge. Um, most of you know that the oversight of the Homeland Security Grant Administration that, that is in my office, um, the HSAA, -A -A -A, HSSA, I call it. Um, no, yeah, that'll, that'll work, that'll work. I always just say the administrative agency. Um, that, uh, that particularly resides in my office, it has since 2005. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, I think that those of you that understand the process of that, that agency, um, may think that you know we're trying to implement a top-down strategy and there's anything but that going on uh, you know we do have state level interest to look out for and I think everybody understands that but much of the content of the applications and reports that we provide FEMA and DHS uh, is gathered and assimilated in meetings such as what you're sitting in today the focus and individual projects within our federal grant applications aren't developed using only the knowledge and desires of those who, of us who work at the Capitol. Um, we know most of our capability resides in your communities, um, within pu public and private organizations, and volunteers certainly play a key role in many of those capabilities. Uh, prevention happens in individual neighborhoods. Response involves random bystanders. Recovery is largely done through steadfast work of non-governmental agencies, and that's, that's key because the government can't do it all. Um, Volunteers help individuals who work their way back to self-sufficiency day by day and task by task. Uh, I appreciate the participation that many of you have had in our grant cycles before, whether you were subgrantees, reviewers, fiscal agents, exercise coordinators, evaluators, or trainers. Uh, every element of what you can provide to what we're trying to accomplish is, is important and key to, to the success of where we're trying to get. Uh, I want to emphasize that grant funding comes to the state as a result of submission of other information. It doesn't come from just uh, information that, that we sit around at a table and David thinks of on a day-to-day -day basis. The assessment and analysis <laughs> requirements continue to increase. Uh, I think some of you are involved in what we'll call Thyra. I know that's been a big headache for David. That's the, the threat and hazard identification and risk assessment tool. It's, um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. But it's a very, very valuable document. Uh, you know, it's, a lot of things come out of the federal government, and I'm not taking a shot at them, but uh, you know, I think we all get bogged down in processes and procedures sometimes, and we feel like we're just doing things to spin wheels and justify our existence. But I think Thyra is teaching us a valuable lesson. So uh, if you haven't been involved in, in Thyra creation um, and you have the opportunity to, I think you'll learn a lot through that process. I, I think you would agree with that, David. Absolutely. Uh, there's another tool that helps these are another tool that helps us focus and quantify the, the thyroid is another tool that helps us focus and quantify our capability building and sustaining effort uh, volunteer groups must be part of the process to tap, tap, try to capture our true capacity uh, along with the thyroid we also submitted our fifth I'm happy about that our fifth state preparedness report uh, which shows us where we are making progress, where we're holding our own, where we need to put more efforts in, and where we need to just really focus to sustain our existing capacity. Please know that we are significantly improving numerous capacities around the state. Um, you know, I briefly mentioned it a minute ago. 
Um, territorialism, I, I, I've said this for years, territorialism, I hate the way this thing is bouncing around, I'm sorry for that, it's probably distracting. Um, territorialism has always been one of the biggest hindrances to success across all things that we do, whether you're public sector or private sector, but certainly in state government, um, I've looked at it as, as a huge hindrance to what we're trying to accomplish. Um, but I think what we're learning through shrinking resources and, and challenging times is that, you know, we have to break outside those barriers uh, and work more closely with uh, other state agencies that, that, that do all kinds of capacity and capability building, but certainly the, those that award grant, uh, preparedness grants. Um, our senior advisory committee, I'm happy to announce, has been reconvened, um, and, and it's growing our mutual awareness and coordination of preparation funding and uh, preparedness funding, excuse me, and programs at the state level. Uh, the SAC involves Citizen Corps, involves uh, threat preparedness within DHHR, which is Jerry Roadshop, uh, emergency management, law enforcement, and homeland security personnel. Uh, we've begun the work of, a, of what I would call a working group that's going to do a lot of the legwork for the SAC, um, and that will just really help ensure that we have better grant alignment moving forward. Uh, they're currently conducting a series uh, of regional improvement planning workshops, so if you get an opportunity to uh, be a part of that or sit in or, or just talk with the folks that have been part of that, um, I, I think it will be a valuable uh, tool for you. Uh, certainly, I encourage your particip participation if you are interested. I need some water. Uh, further training and education will also be forthcoming on it. No, that's all right. No, 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 really. Don't. don't, don't. I just, my mouth is so dry. I'm sorry. Um, I didn't drink enough coffee this morning. Uh, and certainly, lastly, I want to reemphasize how critical I believe community and individual preparedness is in part of our overall public safety mission. Um, you know, I'm fortunate to know and work with many talented planners, responders, and recovery personnel. Uh, but ultimately, the success uh, of our efforts to mitigate or prevent bad incidents and to recover them from... Sorry, there's no money in the budget for you either. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, but ultimately, the success of our efforts to mitigate and prevent uh, bad incidents and to recover from those uh, resides within each of us as citizens in the communities where we live and work. I think, I think that's something that we all understand or we wouldn't be here today. Uh, you know, we have to take it upon ourselves to report suspicious activity. Um, it, you know, the Fusion Center is part of the Department of Military Affairs and Public Safety, and, and they're developing uh, the Fusion li Liaison Officer Program, and it's, uh, it's about 100 and plus strong now. Uh, and they're individuals that live in, and work and breathe and exist in the communities that we all live in. And, and basically their assignment is to keep an eyeball on things. And when they see something that just doesn't make sense, they're to reach out to the Fusion Center and, and give them information on that so we can look into it. Every little bit of information that we pull together now in the communities we live in will help us down the road. Um, you know, I think we're, and forgive me, for, I'm, I'm horrible with time frames, but I think we're about six to eight months removed by the, the horrific images of Boston. Um, you know, I think, it, you know, it may not be as a significant event as what we saw 9-11, but it's certainly one of those things that makes you stop and say, I know where I was that day and I know what I was doing that day uh, when that occurred. Um, that incident shows us the real need for enhancing our capabilities and understanding what our weaknesses are. 9-11 um, told us that information sharing wasn't going far enough and that's the whole collaboration and cooperation piece and I think we're doing a much better job of it today. Um, but Boston taught us the little things, little things such as the ability to apply a tourniquet isn't an antiquated system because that's something that was very much needed those days. So, um, you know, we have to, we have to keep hold of the, the, the systems of the past while we're trying to move forward with the systems of the future. Some people, uh, are at times it may seem like personal preparedness is just a, a stepchild, if you will, to, to fancy response capabilities, and that's anything but the truth. Uh, we have considerable equipment and training uh, that we certainly bought and put in place to try to ensure that we can manage uh, the technical facets and the sophisticated facets of responding to various threats. But that, you know, that, that doesn't stop there and in no way it diminishes the, the paramount responsibility that we each have to take actions to care for ourselves, our families, neighbors, and others with whom we interact. Um, we can't just think about preparedness, we, we have to act on it. 
I know that many of you are, are here for that very reason. Um, you know, most of the time, conferences are, are sometimes a struggle. Um, this conference uh, is, is a significantly important conference in trying to understand what each of you do together and uh, networking will, will be a, a significant resource for each of you. So, you know, if, if you don't know the folks around you, and I see a lot of faces that I'm familiar with, but I, I certainly don't know everybody here. Um, David mentioned that I, that I am accessible. I pride myself on accessibility. Um, if you send me an email, I will answer it. Uh, if you call and I'm available, you know, I, I, I have a lot of meetings some days, but um, if I'm not there to take the call, uh, I will call you back. Uh, no issue is too small or too large. Um, I'm interested in what I can do to help you make your jobs better and easier. So please never hesitate. If you're at the Capitol any, at any point and you just want to see what the Department of Military Affairs and Public Safety looks like, fourth floor of the West Wing, um, we're a small office, uh, but the department is made up of about 6,000 employees and 10 divisions, and we're all things public safety and military. So um, I'm going to stick around as long as I can today. Uh, I certainly look forward to engaging anybody that would like to just chat me up. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, I can't thank each of you enough for what you do on a daily basis. Uh, and I certainly appreciate you taking the time to be here today as well. Thank you. Thank you.